في القلب, في القلب مشاعر أختيها قد أشرقت الشمس عليها عن خطط لم أعبأ فيها ستكون بأيام يفرقا All right, so now came uh, Umar. And I'm not going to go in any kind of detail into Umar because there's so much to say about the 10 years of Umar that you can do a course, a whole course, a full semester just about the 10 years of Umar because Umar was not only um, you know, known as, as we know him through many stories as the most pious and uh, among the most pious and he was known for his justice to Muslims, to non-Muslims. He was an administrative genius. He had an understanding of what people were going to do, how people were going to react. Um, and he's somebody who self-sacrificed. He sacrificed him, himself. Um, and I will, of course, notice that Abu Bakr, the Prophet Sallallahu died without nominating anyone. And Abu Bakr died, but nominating someone who was not a member of his family. And when Umar died, we will see, he also um, nominated six uh, members of the circle from the prophet of the circle of the prophet وسلم, but not, nobody from his family he explicitly said my son abdullah who was a man at this time and very well liked uh, he said he has nothing to do with this he doesn't get close to this that um, in other words both abu bakr and umar were very concerned about not ma making um, this issue a dynastic issue. The issue of the Khilafah, the issue of rule of the Muslims was not going to be dynasty, something that you can just pass on to your son. So this was a characteristic of the Khilafah. This was a necessary characteristic of uh, the Khilafah, that a Khalifa is an employee of the Ummah, and does not own the ummah. Whereas a king is someone who can do tasarruf, who can do whatever he wants in, uh, with the wealth uh, of the ummah, right? Or, or wealth of his subjects. So that's the difference between a khalifa and a king. And these people were khulafa. These people were walking in the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they took from Muslims only what was necessary for their survival, and they were responsible to Muslims, and they were to be corrected by Muslims. Um, the 10 years of the rule of Umar were the golden era of conquest that was also known for good governance and legendary justice. So what Muslims, you see every conquering army, and conquests are not uncommon in history, many, many uh, have come in the past, but um, the armies usually um, emphasize a strategy, either say carrot or stick, either they um, show that they are so ferocious and they're so uh, absolutely uh, powerful that there's no point fighting them. Like shock and all kind of doctrine that we will have so much power and we will be so obnoxious, we'll be so uh, terrifying in our conduct if you resist us that there's no point in fighting. And we will see when the Mongols came uh, to the Middle East and to Europe, they adopted this strategy of terror. They would create minarets of skulls and people simply lost any motivation to fight them, any kind of courage to fight them. They thought the Mongols are a scourge of God that could not be defeated and their, their, their terror was their weapon. For Muslims, um, it was their justice and their, the carrot. The carrot was as soon as you come under our rule, you're going to be treated justly and fairly, even if you do not accept. If you join our religion, you're going to become from among us. Uh, otherwise, you will have fair taxation and protection. And that was that policy, that general policy that we already saw at the time of the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr, it was institutionalized and became real in the time of Umar, because now you have many more people that came under Islamic rule. All right. Um,
this was the um, an, an incident which explains the nature of the authority as Umar radiallahu an explains. Remember Abu Bakr has said, I'm not the best of you and correct me if I'm wrong. This, if you will, is the second uh, or among the next constitutional development in Islam because here Umar says, further explains through an analogy what a ruler is. I've placed myself in respect to Allah's property in the same relation as the guardians of orphans to this orphan's wealth. Using uh, in the Quran in Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the property of a of orphan, that somebody, you know, uh, if, because the father is dead, somebody else will take care of the property of the orphan. They can take from that property only what they need. And if they don't need, then they should not take anything, any salary or anything, any stipend from the property. So think of the ummah. Ummah is a property of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it belongs to Allah. And, and it was the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the khalifa, is simply somebody who is uh, taking care of their property. He doesn't own them, own them. And that is the um, analogy that Umar uses. So this, you could say this is the beginning of a kind of jurisprudence because by making this analogy, you can draw other rules of the rights and responsibilities of the ruler. And he says, if I'm well off, I will refrain from anything from taking anything from it, if I, I'm in need, I will take from it in moderation. If I become my law later, I will repay. And similarly, there was some uh, interesting conversation which explains these, if you will, constitutional points about what about the Khulafa and how these uh, Umar radiallahu anh, thought of himself. By the way, Umar called, you know, there was this discussion about what should we call you, Umar, because now Abu Bakr was the Khalifa of the Prophet. He was successor of the Prophet, then Umar was going to be successor of the successor of the Prophet. Right? Khalifat Khalifat Rasulullah. And Umar said, well, this is going to get really long, you know, but if you have a 10th khalifa, khalifa, you're gonna to have to say Khalifa 10 times. Um, so he said, what should we call uh, the ruler? And um, the, the choice or, or, or suggestion was given that you are Amir, now, Amir is a very sort of a military commander term. It's a very humble term for the Arabs. Amir is like, you know, people are traveling. One of you is an Amir uh, who can decide whether we know when we're going to travel, when we're going to do what um, in an expedition. So he's a military commander. So Amir al-Mu'mineen is a commander of the believers. It's a title that has built into it extreme humility. So now the Khalifa of Muslims uh, or Khalifa of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, who was the Khalifa of the Prophet sallam, was given the name of Amirul Mu'mini, Commander of Believers. All right. Um, there were a number of interesting and very important institutions such as Baytul Mal that was established in the time of Umar and I don't have time to discuss the significance of Baytul Mal, but until Umar, there was no permanent treasury and if you don't have permanent treasury, you could even debate whether a state existed. Because if we, the way we think of the state that it has permanent employees and permanent wealth that could, you know, that then is needed in order to pay permanent employees, that didn't really get established until the time of Umar radiallahu anh, when after Iraq was conquered. Um, so again, when we use the word state, technically there are many different parts of the word of state that it's permanent, uh, it's an abstract institution, that it has total monopoly over violence, or at least uh, for the large part in the territory that it governs. And in many cases, in many ways, uh, the Islamic uh, Khilafa was becoming a state. It started as leadership of da'wah. It was a da'wah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a mission, a movement that then was turning into a uh, a permanent institution that we can call state today. <clears throat> he established new cities um, in Iraq. He established the two important cities of Basra and Kufa, and those are important cities because they will become Im uh, important in, in the stories uh, in the story of Islam later. Uh, Basra and Kufa in Iraq, and Fustat was the city uh, that was established in Egypt. 
Um, in Syria, no new city was established because the people, the army of Muslims that conquered Syria were Arabs who already had long-time relations with the Syrian elite. And so they knew how to share the city and they actually shared the city, didn't occupy in, in a sense of didn't force themselves into it. They, um, they, could, they knew they did not disrupt and interrupt the city. Whereas the armies that conquered Iraq were, a lot of them were nomadic Arabs. And Umar was worried that these people, because they don't know how to live in cities, they're going to disrupt the life of the cities. They're going to take the best places, or perhaps they're going to interrupt the agricultural output. Um, and so Umar uh, and also Umar was worried that these people are going to become more like the Persians, like peasants, people who are gonna settle down. Whereas Umar wanted to ensure that Muslims remain committed to jihad. And jihad was not easy. It was refusal to settle down. And all of us want to settle down, right? And you know, for, for a little few years you fight, but then you want to settle down. But for to continue on, it was very important that the life of luxury was not um, was not um, you know easily made available to them. And so instead of uh, mixing with the Persian cities, Umar for both of these reasons, established two new military camps uh, that became cities of Kufa and Basra. Basra was closer to them, closer to Arabia, and then Kufa was on um, the other side, a little farther away. Um, also, a famous important institution at the time of Abu Umar was the institution of Diwan. Diwan literally just means a register or a bureau. So the Sassanids had used these registers of bureau to pay off, to pay, so to pay their, uh, employ, uh, their soldiers. And Umar copied that and even, in fact, it remained in the a Persian language for the time being until later. Um, so this was sort of an administrative adaptation that Abu, uh, that Umar accepted. Himself, he lived like an ascetic as the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr had lived um, and so on. Now I'm going to skip some of these a little more advanced topics. Um, Actually, you know what? I'm going to uh, take a break now, inshallah. We'll take a 10 minute break. Uh, actually, let's make it five minute break. And then I will come back after five minutes and take any questions. Bismillah rahman rahim So, one interesting incident shows uh, a lot, it, it throws light on the, the nature and method of governance and the concerns that the Sahaba had and particularly under the leadership of Umar ibn al-Khattab When Muslims conquered Iraq, a lot of land was, uh, came under Muslim control. This land was the golden cow of the region. Um, and the reason being that this was a very fertile land because of the, the two rivers, Dajla and Furat or Tigris and Euphrates. And both of these uh, rivers brought, you know, silt and, and, and rich uh, in nutrients, which made the, um, the, the growth uh, from this land, the richest and the most fertile, uh, the land is most fertile in the region compared to Syria and even Egypt. And um, there was something special about the, the lands of Iraq, unlike you know, rain, uh, lands that are irrigated by rain, these were artificially uh, fertile lands. These were based on the ancient irrigation system that the people of the region had invented. And that was the, the secret of their success 
and their wealth. But unlike natural agriculture, irrigated lands can become gold only with investment. And so these were special lands that required investment and they were, uh, but they were black gold, if you will, at the time. Um, now, when these lands came under Muslim control, you had a serious administrative challenges. One possibility was to treat them as ghanima, as if you will, booty that was to be distributed to the soldiers. Now, if distributed to the soldiers, you know, many soldiers would have gotten small patches of land, but um, that kind of administration for small patches of land um, would not have been useful uh, to people who got small amount of land, right? Um, because they did not have the investment for agriculture. So the lands would have, the, the, the richest land in the world, if you will, would have become, uh, would have been lost partly also because uh, Umar uh, radiallahu and the elite in Medina, the Sahaba did not want the Muslims to become peasants and settle uh, because peasants are tied to the land. They cannot be warriors, right? And um, the other problem was that if land was given to a few people, they would become, uh, if you will, landlords and all the Muslims who came in the future would simply um, be kept from that land. So Umar radiallahu wanted to do something else with that land. After the conquest of Iraq, he did not want it to be treated like uh, spoils, but rather he wanted to do something else. And uh, other Sahaba, particularly Ali radiallahu but also Bilal and others, they did not agree to this. They, they th agree with this idea. They thought that this was a, the Sunnah at the time of Prophet وسلم, when people used to, you know, when anybody who participated in a battle, when they won the battle, all the belongings of the uh, op opposing army, Ghanima, would be distributed equally among the soldiers. And then the fifth of it will be given to the uh, ruler. But Umar radiallahu anh, felt that this would turn, th that, at, that those lands or, or those, the Ghanima at the time of the Prophet وسلم, was different. That this, these lands were too enormous and they were different kind of property because they required investment and then they were gold that they should belong to all Muslims, not to only those soldiers who participated in the battle. Disagreement did not get resolved uh, immediately. They debated. And according to one uh, tradition, uh, they debated the issue for three days straight. And there was no resolution until Umar came upon this ayah in the Quran. So they're trying to go back to the Quran and the Sunnah and try to find, everybody's trying to find a resolution, a final, if you will, um, uh, dalil, right? From the Quran and the Sunnah so that this issue can be settled. And they, uh, Umar came upon this ayah in Surah Al-Hashr that I just recited earlier that praises the Muhajireen and then the Ansar. Uh, and this Surat al-Hashr came down when Bani al-Nadir, the, the Jews, were expelled from Medina uh, for conspiring to kill the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, their lands came to Muslims, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet then, um, and then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala said that the lands belong to the Muhajireen and then the Ansar. And then, وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ those who came after the Muhajirin and the Ansar, and they pray for the Muhajirin and the Ansar. Um, and Allah says, it is as if, if you look at the surah carefully, it is Allah is saying that the, those fay, the land or the, the booty that has been given to you without fighting. So there are two kinds of booty, one for which you have specifically fought and the other that has come to you as a result of the power Allah has given to Islam as if you will to Muslims in general as a body. And those, 
That is called fight. So there are two kinds of things. There's ghanima, which is spoils, specific spoils of war, and then fight. Fight are conquered lands that are not uh, conquered militarily, you know, inch by inch, yard by yard, but rather these are, once the land, if you will, uh, opens, once a country opens, all of the lands come under Muslim control. Now, Muslims or Arabs do not have a concept of conquering lands at this time. Remember, uh, they only know conquering, um, you know, um, caravans, movable property, right? So Umar Radilan uses this ayah to say, look, there is a future tense here. There is a, a consideration of future generations of Muslims that if I give this property to just those who participated in the battle, then what's going to happen to this third category, those who came after? And these are people who will, not just now, but for the future. So Umar radiallahu had this uh, spark of genius uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he read this ayah in such a in, a, in a way that other people were not reading it. And, to, and even though you could say now looking at it, that of course it's there already, but that is what ijtihad is. That's how fiqh is, develops. So basically there is a futuristic consideration that's already there in the Quran, but it, uh, it comes to light when Umar radiallahu uh, brings it. And that is what resolves the debate. And even though it seems, it seems that not everybody is fully convinced but the majority uh, is uh, convinced that this is the right interpretation and the lands are then uh, become the property of Muslims at large and not of any particular uh, group. Those lands are called Sawafi and those, uh, and this is also the beginning of a permanent state because to, be, to have permanent employees, you need permanent sources of income. And when you have permanent source of income, you need permanent employees, right? It's a, it's a connection because once you have permanent income, then you need to figure out uh, how much and when and uh, who's to administer it and who's gonna keep it and who's gonna, how it's gonna be redistributed and so on. So that bureaucracy uh, you know, in a very minimal sense is born that when Baitul Mal is born because now this, there is something called state property that is permanent. Before that, um, the ghanima would be collected and zakat would be collected and then distributed. Uh, and at the end of the year, if you will, there will be nothing left. So this is an important development in Islam. All right, so the Khilafah at this time is a enormous confederation of ad hoc deals. There, there's no single institution of governance that covers all uh, the deals with all different conquering areas. As people are uh, you know, submitting to Muslims, they're making different kinds of deals and Muslims are keeping those deals. Um, there are regional norms of conquest and the, the relative power of those who are conquered and how they're conquered, those who are conquered by force are their deal is different from those who accept to make a peace or those who readily come forward to become part of the uh, uh, Islam that all of those are different deals. So at this time, when we try to think of government as we think in, in modern state, right? Uh, where there is some kind of a, a central uh, constitution or something that and then there is a central law and a central court system that decides, you know, um, how all the citizens, uh, how their rights are uh, to be uh, determined and what the rights are. And none of that exists, <clears throat> right? These are very different. This is a very different system. Um, another thing that most uh, Muslims don't appreciate is that majority of the subjects at this time are non-Muslim and non-Arab. So somewhere something like to 80 to 90% of the population of this vast territory is non-Muslim. Umar radiallahu in the time of Umar, the 10 years of Umar, 
all of Persia is conquered. Now, in the Eastern Persia, this, the conquest is not stable yet. That's gonna happen in the time of Uthman, but the conquest, conquest happens uh, in the time of Umar. And two thirds, some 75% of the East Roman Empire is conquered. The part that is Turkey today, right, that is not conquered. But other than that, what is today, you know, uh, what is what we are, to the Kurdish areas, to Syria, to Egypt, North Africa, all of that is conquered. All, the, all that used to be part of the East Roman Empire. So all of a sudden, Muslims are ruling over a very, very large area. Uh, so the, but majority of these populations are non-Muslim. And so the Muslims are at this time um, very interesting. They're very different from how Islam started. They're in terms of their demographics, they're different from Muslims in Mecca and Muslims in Medina. And they are different from what Islam will soon become after this, uh, all everything settles down. It is, this is a time when the Arabs are conquerors and non-Arabs and non-Muslims are almost the same thing. And almost all Arabs have become Muslim. And this creates the possibility of confusion between Arab and Islam. This is a very important point to understand. Otherwise we cannot understand the civil wars that are coming up and we cannot understand the challenge that the Sahaba uh, and the leadership is facing. All right. Conquests are also, so uh, the, the, the social changes that are taking place are also enormous. Nomadic Arabs are settling um, into cities. These nomads are not used to taxation and government and central control. So, so long as they are conquering, they're part of the conquering army, they have a place. They understand what their relationship is to the state and the, the Khilafah. But when that's, that is, slows down, these people are still too new. And uh, that is a challenge. The other thing that's happening is that Arabs are converting to Islam of all different, there are many different kinds of Arabs. Those who are called, many have converted already to Christianity in the in lands close to Syria um, in, and uh, in Persia also many Arabs have, have converted to Christianity but a different kind of Christianity. Uh, and then you have in Yemen, Arabs who were used to central government and some kind of kingdom. So those are much more, you can say, quote unquote, civilized or city uh, Arabs. And then you have the Northern tribal Arabs and Quraysh, the prophet, the tribe, the prophet Sallallahu it was at the center of it, but they were more Northerners. They were pure Arabs if, or Arabs in, in, in a sense that so they were not Bedouins, they were sedentarized, they were city people, but small cities that were surrounded by nomadic culture. That was the culture of the Northern Arabs. The culture of the Southern Arabs in Yemen was more, more sort of civilized. So all of these Arabs from very different backgrounds are converting and now they have this assimilation and they have to settle down in new cities. And then that the economic situation is changing because the, as you have conquered these two empires and um, the, the, the um, conquest, the frontiers, which are called thugur, frontiers are now getting farther and farther from the center. In order to travel from the center to the frontier, you now have to travel for two, three months. And that also uh, uh, means that uh, you know, the, 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 dis the distance between and the relationship between the center and this frontier is changing. The other thing is the Ridda tribes. Remember, at the time of Abu Bakr, uh, a large number of Arabs rebelled. And Abu Bakr did not trust them, so he did not make them part of the army of jihad because jihad had to be executed by people who were dedicated to uh, Islam. Um, but at the time of Umar, there was a very serious problem. If you did not use these people um, to, um, as soldiers, you had two problems. You had, you know, you had armies that are much, much bigger than your armies. So uh, you have these people that you should, you could use as soldiers. Uh, but if you didn't use them, 
you have a, a, a manpower problem, but also you have a problem of people who are resentful, they're angry, um, they have been defeated. And so Umar radiallahu anh, uses them in the armies of jihad, but this also means that those armies are now much more complicated than the time of Abu Bakr. So everything depended on the ruler's statesmanship, statesmanship, deal-making, trusted piety and justice and charisma and close camaraderie and trust among the ruling elite, among the commanders, the Sahaba. So this was a very, very complex situation. Um, that's kind of thing when we read about the, you know, the, the Sahaba uh, in, in simple stories that I'm sure we have all learned when we, uh, when we were growing up about you know, the great miracles, how Allah SWT gave them victories and how people converted to Islam. All of that is happening, but the background story that these people had human lives that had all the complexity that we have in our lives today. There is, you know, there is changing demographics, there is conquest, there is assimilation, there is all kinds of internal problems, um, ethnic problems, racial problems, if you will, right, that people have today. Class problems are emerging, that people who have more versus those who have less, all of those are there. So all, what, that, what did that mean? Um, I am going to actually skip over the good part, the part that talks about the piety and justice and all of that, because I'm sure you have heard of that. Uh, and if you haven't, it's easy to find and it's easy to understand and digest as well. I'm going to go to the tough part. I'm going to go to go to the part where the challenges, where all of these good qualities are coming up against enormous challenges. Okay, so. Um, part of the challenge of um, Umar's, uh, at the time of Umar Adilan, is that as these new people are coming into Islam, they have very different values and they have very diff different expectations. But for one, um, they're not used to egalitarianism. They're not used to equality. Some make use of that equality and demand their rights. But also this may mean that they are much more open to rebellion because people, for example, people who are used to the Persian or Roman empire, uh, they were used to the emperor being nearly God. The emperor, Persian emperor in particular was absolute, was, was the head of the religious hierarchy as well. And it was part of their religion to see the, their emperor as the manifestation of God and of justice and totally above uh, not only them, but the local chiefs and lords and masters that they may have had. The emperor was absolutist, uh, had total power. Whereas the way the Muslims ruled, um, Muslim Arabs were egalitarian before Islam even, but after Islam, Islam gave them a new kind of equality. And it was of course a meritocratic equality. It was merit-based equality, but still it was equality. And anybody could approach Umar Adilan um, and Umar could not be totally, uh, Umar or any Khalifa could not be totally um, arbitrary with the way that they ruled. They had to rule with, with piety and justice. So all of this means that people who are now coming, they're trying to sort of figure out uh, how to um, deal with these new rulers. Uh, as people are converting to Islam, they're bringing their older traditions, their good things, but they're also their prejudices. Um, and all of that is there when you read the stories carefully. Um, one such incident was the stabbing of Umar, a, uh, a, a Persian slave who is Zoroastrian, is brought into Medina and Umar did not like non-Muslims getting into Medina. But this person is brought into Medina because he's a very good um, um, a sword maker and uh, so he's he and he 
gets into a fight uh, or, or has a dispute with his employer, Umar judges. This man is not happy with Umar's judgment and he poisons his blade and uh, stabs Umar because Umar is uh, you know, leading Fajr prayer, very accessible to anybody. Uh, there was no uh, there palace, there's no palace guards. This is a very egalitarian society. And as a result, Umar dies. Now, sometimes people say that, you know, what kind of khilafa was it that all of these people died? You know, um, three of the khalifas were killed. But the reason for that was not that they somehow were all more sort of quote unquote violent people by nature, but because this was an egalitarian and open society and they were all used to, they were not used to any inequality. And when you build walls between the rulers and the ruled, you have to, you create inequality. The rulers are not um, held accountable because they are behind walls. They're not accessible. And they don't know about the people. They don't live like the rest of the people. So they don't know what ordinary people feel. So part of the great uh, virtue of the, of what it means to be a Khalifa is to feel the security or insecurity that people on the street feel. But that also means that you, your life is now in danger because uh, somebody who is disgruntled at a million things in, in the world could come and say, it's your fault, you are the Amir. So in any way, this is what happens to all of these three cases, Umar, Uthman, and uh, Ali, radiallahu anhu So the reason they were killed was because they were men of the people, because they were servants. And if there was going to be a problem, they were in the front row, right? Not hiding behind. Um, all right. Umar famously institutionalized. He had a great institutional genius and he institutionalized uh, shura um, as uh, or, or election, the process of appointment of the next Khalifa. Um, and uh, that's also a well-known story that I'm going, not going to go into. Now, shura is not some uh, democracy because democracy, which is a you know uh, an ancient Greek institution that, that existed for a couple for a couple of centuries and thousands and thousands of years of, of human civilized history, uh, only a couple hundred years and then it disappeared for another twenty five hundred years and then reappeared in uh, the modern period. So um, we should not look at the entire world through the length the single lens of length, lens of democracy. Nonetheless. Because people, uh, when you look at the practice of shura, the equality, the, the, the accountability, there are naturally people want to make some connection between democracy and shura. So I'd say that the major differences between shura and democracy are that shura is a virtue. The Quran describes that as a virtue of the believers, all believers. It is not a political system, right? Although you could say that even when we use the word democracy, you could say, oh, this is a democratic person, but that's an odd thing. In English, you don't really say this is a democratic person. You can say that this person is kind or gentle and this person is open to advice, uh, but you don't say a democratic person. But shura was something that was the personal virtue of the ruler and all those who were who had any authority, any power. In fact, even if you did not have any authority and power, you wanted to marry a girl, you would, the Prophet said, seek shura, uh, ask your friends, those who are senior to you. So this was a virtue. The second thing um, is that uh, this, of course, uh, the Sahaba are, are ruling at a time when the majority of the rulers uh, of the subjects are not Muslim. And not only that, not only are they not Muslim, but many of them who are outside of Quraysh are resentful of Quraysh. So uh, to bring them into a new system where they can be part of the Shura, they have to first buy in 
to this idea of equality in Islam and the idea of piety, uh, which hasn't happened yet. Uh, it's in the process. You see, tarbiya takes time. And we're going to see um, this question of tarbiya and the generational problem that people are facing at this time. Um, and when we, when we deal with the fitna in the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu. Um, so in a sense, shura can be institutionalized. And if it is institutionalized, it can look something like an electoral system, right? But in their spirit and their philosophy, they're very different because shura is a uh, virtue of consultation, but it doesn't claim that the rule of the people, by the people, for the people. It doesn't claim that there is no other authority but the people, right? There is no, today, uh, democracy is associated with the idea of popular sovereignty. That means people have the ultimate power and ultimate say and ultimate decision in, in the, uh, what, what uh, the nature of government is. Well, in this case, the nature of government of shura is the mission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the da'wah and the, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It has a responsibility from God. So shura is part of that mission. Whereas democracy, philosophically speaking, has a different philosophy. So some people you know, talk about the incompatibility between shura, it's democracy and Islam. I think that they go too far because again, it depends on how you define democracy. But if you want to define democracy as electoral system and system of accountability without the, without the philosophical, ideological or theological part of it, then uh, it could be called that Shura was in some way uh, or can be compatible with democracy. But at this time, uh, democracy is not relevant. What is relevant is the concept of <clears throat> equality of Muslims and what it is closer to what we may call meritocracy rather than democracy. In other words, rather than everybody being equal, everybody's equal according to their merit. And merit lies in two things at this time, in their sabaqa, which means who came to Islam first and who knew more about Islam and learned from the Prophet Sallallahu directly the more you learn from the Prophet, that the more you had a higher status and a sabaqa, and then you had excellence, which is your um, piety and competence. So if you were somebody who came new to Islam, but you, you have exceptional competence in something, you show exceptional knowledge or piety or something, then you, based of, on the base of your merit, you get uh, authority and responsibility and all. All right. Um, this is a map of Muslim armies, expansion of Islam. It begins, you see, from Medina. This is Medina to, this is Iraq. This is through Tabuk. Remember we talked about Tabuk? And then these were the major battles uh, that took place in the time of Umar radiallahu anh. And if you look at the shades of green, you see this, this green, um, this, this is a conquest of the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, these tribes, even though they have become at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they have become Muslim, but they rebel, many of them, and they're brought back under the time in, under Abu Bakr, under Abu Bakr And then after that, uh, this light green, the third light, this is brought uh, uh, under, under the time of Umar radiallahu anh. And then uh, this Persia is brought under control, even though the conquest happens in the time of Umar, but it's brought under control in the time of Uthman, and then conquest spreads uh, all the way to North Africa and farther to Spain uh, in the time of Uthman. And then under Muawiyah uh, or under the Umayyads, the conquests continue. So this is the, the general map of 
the conquest. All right. Um, this is another map of the same kind of thing. Um, this is less detailed, slightly less accurate, but it also shows you more. And so this, these conquests right on the, in the west and the east, they continued under the Umayyads after the Khulafa al-Rashidun. Um, 